Hello and welcome to CB Defense Today. I'm Dr. Eric Moore, Director of the U.S. Army Combat Capabilities Development Command, Chemical Biological Center. During this program, I'll talk one-on-one -on -one with other leaders about topics relevant to chemical biological defense. My guest today, retired Major General John Dolesberg, who in 2010 became the Honorary Colonel of the U.S. Army Chemical Corps. He now serves as a member of the Strategic Advisory Group for the Global Security Directorate. He is also an adjunct fa faculty member of the Howard Baker Center for Public Policy at the University of Tennessee. Welcome, General Dolesberg. Uh, thanks, Dr. Moore. Uh, just a little correction in what's in there. Uh, the Global Security Directorate at Oak Ridge National Laboratory and uh, the University of Tennessee, because of the pandemic, uh, neither one of those have been meeting. So, oh, wow. So I'm taking credit for something that uh, uh, I might not be able to go back to. Well, you know, you've been a man who's been involved in so many levels, whether it's the Army, whether it's doing work for the Department of Defense, Department of Energy, National Labs, um, I'm sure you're going to be gainfully employed some kind of way. So. Uh, you might be right, uh, but as we talked about before, at 75, I do have to start thinking about retirement someday. Well, you know, hopefully it will happen not before the next five years, maybe. We'll, we'll give you 80. I know you said you've been around three quarters of a century now. You've got it. That's a beautiful thing. And so, you know, for the record, you know, General Dolesberg is one of my um, mentors and, and people, who one of my favorite people that exist on this planet. So it's always a pleasure to get to talk to you. So, throughout your career, you have seen the landscape of suburban defense change. In what areas do you see the most growth and modernization? That's a good question because it, uh, it, when you talk about chem and bio in particular, we've seen a lot of modernization. We've seen new equipment. At least in my lifetime, I've watched at least four generations of protective masks. I've looked at four generations by inside or internal capability uh, in reconnaissance capability. Uh, in bio, the same thing. We started off with something as simple as the bids, and, and we've moved on into multiple different iterations of different bio sensing and detecting uh, devices that are out there. The areas that we've seen the least in uh, is obviously decontamination, because it's the hardest. Uh, I know that there's a lot of work going on in that area, and it's extraordinarily important. And as we've also discussed, um, there need to be some inroads made in nuclear detection. Yes. So, you know, and I just want to explore, you know, the beauty is, and I don't think a lot of folks know this, so you and I talk uh, occasionally, and as we talk, uh, you always have some great ideas, and I'm always trying to shake them out. And, so, and you also know a lot of history of where things have come from and gone. And so, you know, I know you spend a lot of time at the National Training Center. And you'll come back and you'll say, hey, Eric, you know, people are doing, soldiers are using X, Y, and Z in certain ways. And, you know, there's an opportunity to, to leverage the way they're doing it with some new technology insertion. So, you know, when I think about updating equipment and innovation requiring looking at problems in new ways, from your experience, how should the CB defense community be looking to innovate for the future? Ah, that's a tough question. <laughs> it really is, because, Innovation is in the eye of the beholder. Um, young, smart scientists, young, smart engineers innovate very, very well when given the opportunity to think broadly after they've seen what's currently being developed. And I think we need to ensure that we afford that opportunity to those young scientists and engineers. Uh, I also think that there is an opportunity uh, for collaboration uh, both within the Army structure and outside the Army structure because innovation doesn't just happen in one location. Right. Innovation can happen in broad spectrum, both uh, in universities and other federal labs. Um, just a broad area that you can look at and find innovation, and that piece of innovation when applied to what you may wor be working on at your desktop or your laboratory space, changes dramatically how you think about what you want to do. You know, when you were at the National Training Center, 
Okay. And you talked about how folks were doing uh, uh, sensing using M8 paper and, and a various uh, numbers of ways of doing that. Subsequent to that conversation, I think we were at um, Regimental Week out at Fort Leonard Wood, and we had a uh, conversation also in uh, General Monero's house because he was the, the commandant of the Seaburn School at the time. And you know, you highlighted the fact that we needed to find ways to bridge the gap between um, soldiers and scientists and whatnot. And DITRA has a program, Scientists uh, in the Foxhole, Scientists at Sea. But you highlighted the fact that you thought it would be good for us to find more ways to get some of our engineers out to the National Training Center. Subsequent to that, we started something that was formed in, in General Monero's basement called the Collaborative Warfighter Integration Program, and we collaborate with the 20th Sobrani to do that. Um, so I would be curious from your experiences, you know, at some of the ways that you think we could better foster a relationship to get our scientists and engineers um, touch points, to, more touch points with soldiers. Of course. You've hit the big key, which is the 20th, because they're the primary users of the technology that's developed at CBC. Uh, and that program at NTC, there's also one at JRTC, where soldiers are using the equipment that's been developed from CBC and the Joint Program Executive Office. And there's a difference in seeing it in a laboratory context, in a testing context, in actual, in the dirt, in the mud, trying to use a piece of equipment that somebody said was all set and ready to go. Um, as you mentioned out at the NTC, NTC is different from the standpoint that it's sand and it's hot, <laughs> like really hot. <laughs> and to see how our equipment actually operates there. But more importantly, to see what soldiers do with the equipment. Uh, the one piece that you were alluding to is to be able to do an operation to go into a facility that may be producing chemo bio, bio agents uh, requires a set of detectors that need to be used because you're also worried about explosives that could be on the door to keep you from being able to enter. And uh, young soldiers, when they don't have the right device, what they'll do is they'll make shift. And so as I mentioned before, what they did is they took three different devices. Well, two of them were the same, but set at a different frequency, and one in the middle, and duct taped them together <laughs> so that they could do that particular operation quicker. Because if not, especially in the heat that's out there, uh, you're in protective overgarments and you don't have a whole lot of time. And you've got to be able to execute that mission to be able to get in as the initial entry so the survey teams can get in and find out exactly what's going on there. So innovation is great on the part of soldiers. What's bad is that why can't we build one device that does what all three of those do? I, I appreciate that because you, when, you, when you look at it uh, in total, how much the warfighter is being overburdened. Soldiers are carrying so much equipment. There's so many things they've got to control, uh, so many different processes. And they're all different. They all have different standards. Um, and just training to stay up to speed on them is, is, is challenging. So I, I really think that that's something we definitely have to do. I want to go a little further and talk about um, some of the challenges that you see when it comes to innovation and modernization and how we can leverage that as we advance technology. Perhaps opportunities hmm. for future development. What I'm gonna do is use an analogy from something that I saw out at one of the national labs. It's gonna sound roundabout, but I'm gonna to get to the point. <laughs> uh, this is how we always talk anyway. <laughs> when I first arrived out at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, we were doing a, a layout of some of the technologies that they had. And uh, we were showing it to a number of folks who, who had come in. And one of them was very interesting. It was a Petri dish with something that looked like a round piece of glass in the center of it. And this really big fella is there and he is explaining it's super hydrophobic. And I'm looking at a piece of glass and I'm going, 
I'm having a hard time figuring out super hydrophobic in a piece of glass. But he takes a bottle with an eye, eyedropper and drops little drops on top of that piece of glass. And the water just bounced off. He then took the bottle, emptied it out, poured it over the glass. And the glass, when you looked at it from the side, had a bubble over the top. Mm. It completely was untouched Wow! by that. Well, afterwards, I walked over to him and I said, you know, that's, that's really interesting work that you're doing. And it's innovative in your thought process. But what good is it? <laughs> and he said, what do you mean? I said, how could you ever use that for anything? About a year and a half, two years later, I left and went out to Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory for two and a half years. Uh, when I came back, I happened to be walking down what they refer to as Main Street at, at Oak Ridge at the laboratory. And sure enough, John was there walking just in front of me, because he's huge, <laughs> I'm not. Uh, so I tapped him on the shoulder and I said, John, how are you doing? He says, I'm doing great, except you pissed me off. <laughs> and I said, John, wh John, what do you mean by that? He said, well, you told me that you know the work I was doing wasn't going anywhere. And I, he, I said, well, I didn't mean it that way. <laughs> I just didn't understand it. And he said, can you come up to my laboratory? And I said, sure, I'd love to. He said, I want to show you some things that I've done now. So I went up to his laboratory, and what I found out that uh, he had done is everything from changing paint to diatonaceous earth and a number of other processes. He had taken that, what he'd learned in using the glass, and now transferred it out to a bunch of other areas. So innovation, from my perspective, is one to be looked at, then questioned, and then applied. And right now, it is very difficult in the environment we're in um, to get all three steps and do it rather rapidly. Uh, it's an important process. I don't think I really helped John. <laughs> I think he was probably going to do it on his own anyway. But I'm glad that I pissed him off and he decided that he wanted to go ahead and show me what it was that he was doing. Uh, that work now is being used by uh, several organizations within the Department of Defense. That's, you know, that was an interesting time when you were at Oak Ridge. I remember um, Dr. Pete Nanos called me up upstairs in the director's a big conference room at DITRA. And I was there, and he wanted me to meet with you and whatnot, and, and Larry Evers, I think you had with you, about some new technologies and what, whatnot that you all were developing. And so I don't think a lot of folks realize that historically, DITRA also has a lot of national laboratory uh, research that's going on. And so we actually funded Larry Evers based upon our meeting and whatnot. But when I saw you, I almost didn't recognize you at first because you had a beard at that time, and I didn't recognize the fact that you were actually working at Oak, Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And we worked together for a while. We funded Larry. And then, of course, you moved um, to your next assignment with the well, Department of Energy Laboratories. Um, was it Los Alamos? Uh, Lawrence Livermore. Lawrence, Lawrence Livermore. How did that come about? I was uh, just out of curiosity. Um, <clears throat> interesting process. Uh, I was enjoying my work at Oak Ridge, enjoying what I was doing. And uh, my boss came in to see me, and he said, um, Patel, who had the contract at Oak Ridge, was participating as one of the members of a team that was uh, trying to uh, win the contract for Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. And he said, what I need is I need somebody to help write the proposal, because they're standing up something called a Global Security Directorate. And it's very similar to our National Security Directorate that we have at Oak Ridge. And you know the most about that, so could you go out there to California and help write? I said, sure, wouldn't mind doing that. So got out there, uh, we're in the Bechtel building, we're writing away, we're just about finished with it. And uh, the soon-to-be director <laughs> called me into his little cubicle that was there, and he started talking to me about my background and what I'd done and all that sort of thing. And, he said, great, thanks, John. I really appreciate, uh, appreciate the meeting. Went back to where I was at, my little cubicle, and I'm doing my writing and everything else. <clears throat> Next thing I know, I get a phone call from Oak Ridge National Laboratory saying, 
did you sign up to be the head of the Global Security Directorate <laughs> at uh, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory? I said, not that I know of. I said, well, the director, or who's supposed to be the director, uh, says he wants you to be in charge. And I said, okay, well, if that's the case, let's go ahead and let's go do that. Wow. You know, as people hear our CB Defense Today podcast, what they don't realize is this is how our conversations go all the time. We go back and forth. Uh, and I learn a lot as, as a, not only I consider you a mentor and a friend, but just kind of hearing how serendipitously things occur and how you've handled it. it these are life lessons for me as well, so I really appreciate it. And it also gives a lot of history about a lot of things that are going on in national security and, and protecting us, our nation against uh, the, the, the uh, deleterious effects of seaburn threat agents. So I wanted to touch on the fact that you know you you've been on been helping us as, as an advisor. We've looked at operational models and kind of strategic planning. So you know CBC is constantly working to advance our operating model and create new partnerships to support our nation. What are some areas where the CB community as a whole needs to work together to build the future of CB defense? Historically, the CB community has been fairly separate, uh, which is not a good thing. Um, you have multiple laboratories that work in the same areas, maybe for different solutions, but sometimes as they look at that solution, there's another application to it, but they just don't know it. Uh, we tried all the way back from the public law to try to find a way to pull those together, to cause interface and action between uh, all of those different uh, laboratories that are there in the ChemBio defense arena, and with some success in, in certain areas. But we still haven't quite gotten there yet, where there's an open dialogue between those different communities so that we can actually move solutions faster, uh, not just throughout the system, but to actual production of that particular solution. You know, part of what you just described also r resonates with me because it's always difficult. It seems like, and I could be wrong, but to me, Eric Moore's perspective only, that uh, the Seaburn defense community is oftentimes um, kind of insular. Um, as a matter of fact, I still get NBC, which, which we, don't, we don't talk about NBC that much anymore, and people say, instead of nuclear, biological, chemical, NBC, nobody cares. I have literally have had general officers say that to me within the past five years <laughs> as I've been briefing certain things. And so, you know, what do you think we can do to make some of our leaders more aware of not only the threat, but our, our capabilities and just the need to partner more effectively? Okay. The threat piece is, is hard because our intelligence community doesn't do a really good job of laying out exactly why should I worry about this. Mm -hmm. We'll say this is bad and we have a, a high degree of confidence that it's bad and that it's out there. Is that your number one? Is that your number two? Is that your number three? Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to take a look at the whole array of things that are out there and decide where it is that you're going to interact. Uh, I don't think this happens, but it could. You take the easiest one first and work your way up to the hardest. Uh, I think good scientists and engineers take the hard one first and say, okay, this is hard, and if we can solve it, these others will fall into place. Um, I think that uh, in that process, uh, the interaction we were talking about before becomes extremely important. Uh, and even sp stretches beyond those people who are in the in the Kimbio defense arena. It stretches into all the other aspects that are out there. Um, I can remember a day when, if they were developing a tank, uh, a tank wasn't just a platform uh, to fire a main gun. 
a tank was a platform for all sorts of things, to include chemical agent detection for overpressure, for a number of other capabilities that we worked with them on. And it was because together we said, if we can do that, we can save lives. I, I really resonate with that. Um, and we're constantly in the fight to, to, to do that. But I do think that um, getting the right messaging to the right folks and making it relevant to them yeah. and, and their needs into operations and readiness. We talked earlier. I, what I find interesting is, is an understanding of how important places like CBC are that underneath every system that sits out there today, there is some basic research that went on, some advanced research that went on to make that vehicle capable to do its mission in chem and bio. And as we change, as technology improves, testing that technology to ensure it's the right replacement for there. I don't know if, maybe I should take it on, I don't know. <laughs> Going out and talking about how that piece of equipment that's out there, whether it's chem bio defense equipment or it's something that straps on to a main battle tank, how it works, why it's important, and where did the underlying technology come from? I think that's what's lost in today's environment, is where did it come from? And if it came from there, if I want other good ideas, if I want to solve other things, or I need a breakthrough, who are you gonna call? You know, and this makes me think about some of the experiences you've had with the Department of Energy Laboratories and National Labs. And because each service, each interagency component has a different culture. And so when I think about the work that you did with, the, with um, Oak Ridge National Laboratory and Lawrence Livermore, did you see, find any lessons that you think that the DOE modernization and, and the way that they innovate that are applicable to things we could do as an Army lab? I'd say the first is that there is a larger investment in the DOE laboratories in basic research. Um, they will tell you that they do applied research, but by and large, it's basic research that they're focused on. And because of that, they make some tremendous breakthroughs, particularly in areas which support Department of Energy, but also outside of Department of Energy. Unfortunately, outside of Department of the Energy, don't always see those, uh, those breakthroughs they've made. But again, it's, it's that focus on funding basic research so that you can make those breakthrough discoveries. You know, from my perspective, and having funded some of the national laboratories and even some of the CWMD, Combating Weapons of Mass Destruction Space, one thing that I've noticed, what do they call it, LD, what's that? LDRD. LDRD, that funding that they have in that space, they seem to have the stick to itness to allow an idea to mature. Yeah. Uh, one of my observations in the Army sometimes is that we start basic research, and if it doesn't pan out to a certain level within three years or so, we want to kill the project. And I've seen uh, at some of those DOE labs, they actually maintain it long enough to it gets to a point where it can actually, as I say, mature on the vine versus die on the vine. Uh, you're exactly right. Laboratory-directed research and development. Uh, I watched some work when I first got there, much like John's work, and uh, his was six years in development, but he was funded that entire time. Uh, they, sh they saw the possibilities. They didn't see the application, but they saw the possibilities of the work that he was doing, solving something called superhydrophobic and superhydrophobic materials. Um, I also saw some others that just as I was leaving Oak Ridge in 2015 uh, were just now maturing, and there was an age-old question, who do we go to now to uh, fund the last step and to get it in place? So, you know, we've talked previously about using internal funds, and for us that's using NDA Section 2363 funds, which is a 4% um, charge. And so I could, couldn't imagine us funding with 2363 for six years straight the same project um, 
and, and allowing it to get some maturity. You know, our model is, is pretty much you do it for a short period of time, and hopefully you can get someone from DITRA or some other organization, DARPA, or someone to pick that up and have it as a cost reimbursable project. Um, so I really like that idea. I'm sure you got plenty more, and I'll be picking your brain to get some of these fantastic sure. ideas. And so, kind of just on a personal note, um, as I share with you, I'm going to be Heading to Nashville, and I think you're in Knoxville now. Yes, I, I hear you're quite the pit master, so I'm, I'll be stopping by. <laughs> I'll be stopping by all 40 when I'm coming through Knoxville, going to Nashville. Make, make sure you give me a day in advance <laughs> notice, because uh, that big old smoker that I have takes a little while to warm up. Mm, I mean, we, we're going to enjoy that. And, well, sir, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure. This has been a great discussion about the chemical biological defense community and the many opportunities that we have to grow and tackle current and emerging threats. So again, thank you, John Dolzberg. It's always a pleasure speaking with you, and I appreciate you taking the time today. Eric, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure indeed. Okay, team, stay safe, stay strong. Until next time. <laughs>